Hi, I'm Lorna Slater. I'm one of the co-leaders of the Scottish Green Party. I've also been working with the Scottish Greens Women's Network on our Take a Stand campaign to get more women into politics. I am Alice Mumford. I'm the Communications and Engagement Manager at Ingender, which is Scotland's feminist policy and advocacy organisation. For full disclosure, I'm also a member of the Green Party um, and have experience of the standing in elections, but I'm here as in gender. Thank you so much for agreeing to speak with me today, Alice. I want to speak to you as a sort of expert on gender matters around gender about what it is, what is going on with women in politics. We have too, my opinion, too few women in mm -hmm. politics. We have to do all this extra stuff to help to help women into politics. I think that that's really important mm -hmm. to do. Uh, not everybody thinks this. Can, can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. So, I mean, first off, it's not just your opinion that there aren't enough uh, women in politics. It's uh, it's a mathematical opinion. <laughs> if you um, if you think we should have representative politics, we currently do not. Um, we do not have enough women um, in any of our chambers of power. So in Holyrood, in local councils, um, at Westminster, in the European Union. Um, in community councils, women's voices are not there. And that is not because women are underrepresented, in my view, it's because men are overrepresented. Um, and it's also really important to note that when we're talking about representation, we're talking not just about gender, but about race, but about disability, but about sexuality, but about trans status. Um, so when, we, when I say men are overrepresented in politics, I mean white, straight, non-disabled, cisgender men are overrepresented in politics. And that means that they are making the decisions using their lived experiences, using their priorities, um, using their interests to lead the things that our country focuses on, that, that, that leads what we spend money on, um, that leads what we talk about and what we see of national importance. So first off, we don't have a good democracy if we're not um, ha if we don't have equal representation in politics. And we're we're very far away from that. One thing that um, is particularly frustrating for uh, feminists or anyone involved in trying to get women involved in politics is this idea that we've already achieved it because we have a female first minister and um, many of the leaders of parties, particularly in Scotland, have been women. And people say, look, how on earth can you say that there's not uh, enough women represented when our leader is a woman? Um, and of course, that's fantastic. Having a woman in charge does not mean, of course, we have uh, feminist policies, as, as the UK can attest to. But it also hides what's going on underneath that, which is less than 30% of our local councillors are women. It's the people making decisions around schools, around leisure activities, around roads, um, around all these things that affect our day-to-day -day lives. Um, so it's not enough just to look at who's, um, who's speaking in First Minister's questions, but actually um, what's happening below that. Um, and you, I'm just going to interject yeah. there. So I work in engineering, mm -hmm. something <laughs> which is nothing to do with schools or hospitals or even things we remotely associate with femininity or gender. And women are wildly upper, underrepresented in renewable energy mm -hmm. policy, in you know making things out of big chunks of metal, steel working, manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Women are wildly under, underrepresented in these areas as well and not and in the policy making in these yeah. areas. So it, it it's something that's across industries and across society. Absolutely. I think engineering is a really good one to point to and it's about you know, where we make decisions, and it's an example we often use around um, uh, gender budgeting, so, and, and the idea of, of who's making decisions and the idea of investment. So the way that budgets work uh, is that if we build a new fourth road bridge, that is seen as investment because it helps um, people who commute, who are normally men, people who commute in cars, normally men, um, to drive faster. It helps create industry for architects, engineers, um, construction workers, massively dominated by men and yet we don't see investment in childcare as a financial investment that is just seen as a drain on our our, our public purse when of course childcare enables what is more of an everything to function than our children absolutely it blows my mind um, that we don't consider in investing in our young mm -hmm. people and investing in healthy families in healthy home life in allowing people other than commuters to get around the mm -hmm. place how is that not investing? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, even from an economic point of view, you look at the um, so unpaid care work in Scotland, which is still massively done by women, is it's about a third of the, the GDP if it was if it was calculated in those terms. Um, but it's just not. So there's there's the sort of economic argument, but there's also absolutely the what do we value? Why do we think it's more important that 
um, you know, why do refuse workers get paid more than nursery workers? That that, that whole classic. So, so it, you know, politics affects everything in our day to day life. So there's the actual decisions that get made, and they get made differently when you have different voices in the chamber because people have different experiences. They have different things they focus on. They have different ways of working. Um, but there's also obviously just the general importance of representation that you can't be what you can't see and if we're told that the most important people in the land are these old white men in grey suits then what does that tell us about who the important people are in our workplaces in our schools all these sorts of things so there's also just the general idea of who who we see as an authority um, who is held up to be expert and I think that's you know that's something that's been really interesting all the political shenanigans that have been happening for the last few years, this idea of rejecting expertise, but we still do see that the idea of a politician as a white man in a suit, despite Nicholas Durgin, you know, and despite Kez Dugden, despite Ruth Davidson, we still see that white man in a suit. And so, you know, on to the sort of second part of your question, I guess, about people that think, well, you know, we've got a meritocracy. Uh, why do we need to make all this effort to get women involved? Well, A, we clearly don't have a meritocracy if you look at the state we're in. Um, but that also assumes that, you know, all the old arguments, well, men are just naturally better at these things. Um, women don't, women want, don't to. want to be exactly women other interests. <laughs> yeah. They're not interested. So the idea that we're, um, you know, the reason we need to make more of an effort to improve diversity is to enable that meritocracy, because currently actually what's happening is that men are able to access politics because they don't have the barriers in their way um, that women do. And it means, again, for voters, we're not getting a fair choice. We're getting this mediocre man or that mediocre man rather than a mediocre man and an exceptional woman or even a mediocre woman come to that, you know, so... <laughs> It's something that uh, an engineering friend of mine said is that we'll know we have equality in engineering when we start getting mediocre yeah, women. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and, and so that idea that yeah, men are innately better at politics or, or more suited to us is because literally everything in the world tells us that it tells a white man that he can do whatever he wants to be and he deserves to be on those benches. And pretty much everything that all the messages women are faced with is that you're not good enough. So there's there's that idea about representation, who's a politician, but there's also just the actual, the, the more sort of tangible barriers. So I mentioned childcare. Women do vastly more childcare and unpaid care um, than men do in Scotland. So that means evening meetings are much more difficult. Um, we have a real problem of presenteeism in politics. So you are worthy of election um, if you have flyered the most or if you've been to all these meetings or if you've stood on the street stall um, every Saturday afternoon for the last 17 years. Not so easy when you're, um, you know, when, when you've got caring responsibilities um, or when you face misogynistic abuse, when you're at hustings. Um, again, if you know, it's, I've said it's not just about gender, it's also about um, wealth, it's about class. You know, all of these things require um, disposable income to get the bus to meetings to get the childcare to eat on the go because you're rushing between your work and a hustings whatever it might be and um, women are generally poorer than men um, and so so all of these so doing the extra stuff you mentioned which is both parties doing it or anyone wanting to get women involved in politics but also women themselves the extra work that's re required is only to level the playing field. It's not extra. It's it's balancing it out, um, and that is that's just vital to, to to everything to try and have a healthy democracy um, and to, to to enable us to get closer to this the fifty fifty mark, which you know would be a start. I mean, I'm for all women, <laughs> but you know. <laughs> so with this take a stand campaign that the women's network uh, has been working on, there were two different threads to that. One is to sort of normalize standing for election and or nomination is not something where you have to put your head above the parapet it's all of us working to, all of us doing it together it's normal for women to stand and we'll support each other and we don't stand against each other we stand with each mm -hmm. other that was part of the idea and the other part was to help women build their profile and visibility so it's my opinion that in order to be elected in order to get votes that voters need to be able to see you that women need to have visibility and profile Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I think, um, and again, it, it goes back to that idea, and this is not saying that, that women innately do things differently than um, men. 
Um, but there is politics is very much geared around male lifestyles, male ways of doing um, business, if you like. Um, it's very confrontational and it is all about profile. And, and, and while we're sort of operating within that, I'm sure lots of people listening and myself would like that to change and have a more collaborative, more collegiate and more consensus based politics. But that is currently the way it's run. Um, and so, of course, women do need to fight harder and be helped by other women candidates, um, by parties to do that, to raise the profile. We know that um, women are far more likely to be invited on um, on news shows, on TV debates. They're far more, far less likely to be in, asked to write columns in the newspaper. All these things that, again, men many times get handed to them. Um, they're women are far more likely to self-censor uh, self on Twitter because we get rape threats when we don't self-censor and we say um, unpopular opinions um, or we voice anything about politics. So there's all these ways that in the way that women navigate the world where we're told to shut up and reduce our visibility, you know, we're told to not put ourselves out there for fear of violence and, and violence against women is a, a thread that goes through everything women women do in their lives um, and is a cause and a consequence of of women's inequality and, and can't be ignored but but everything we're told is to you know make yourself smaller seen and not heard you know you see it from childhood and up so it's it's very un, um it, it goes against what we've been taught to put yourself out there as women um and of course you don't always get a good response. You know, women are um, bossy, pushy, um, you know, men are natural leaders and authoritative. You know, it, the, the double standard is is huge. And, um, you know, uh, I wasn't, I was told not to swear on this podcast, but obviously the B word <laughs> is thrown around, you know, where we, women politicians are, are, are called Bs a lot. Um, so, yeah, so we, ha we have to put the, the visibility is not being handed to us. Um, so we, we have to get out there and, and make those opportunities and they don't always have to be in um, using inverted commas which isn't helpful on a podcast but um politics you know it's it's about everything and and again that's that's where the real world and, world and politics bleed into each other because in all spheres of life men are given more of a profile in public and women in private you know has ever been thus in terms of men make decisions about um, national budgets and women control the household purse you know it's 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 age old a sort of private public and and so again that's the reason why more work has to be done and we have to be openly saying women stand because every other message says women don't stand excellent thank you thank you for that really good explanation of that because it's something that concerns me is the visibility aspect uh, it's i i I talk about this all the time, but I went to the Antarctic earlier this year with 90 women from around the world, and they were largely academics, mostly scientists. And it's a major problem for women in that sphere as well, is the visibility, is getting the opportunities, it depends on what papers you've written, depends mm -hmm. on which conferences mm -hmm. you go to. And, you know, we've all seen these conference manuals, you know, <laughs> it's, it's very hard mm -hmm. to get that sort of visibility to be seen to be an expert, to be seen mm -hmm. at all. And specifically with politics, my view is that people can't vote for the, you if they don't know who mm -hmm. they are. So supporting women to visibility with visibility in terms of encouraging them to take volunteering opportunities to share their experience with the party, to speak up at meetings, to me is a big part of breaking mm -hmm. down those barriers, that active the active visibility that I think that I th think is so important to help women into politics. Yeah, and I think I mean I think there's that that's absolutely true, and I, but I think there's the flip side of that, and again, that's putting a huge onus on women to make more of an effort to deal with the patriarchy, <laughs> which is what we do every day. Um, and so, of course, there's only a certain you know at the end of the day, there has to be a certain point of. Yes, women have to get out there and they have to do these things. But there are also structural things we can do to change and challenge that. Um, when you're talking about scientists, just made me think, and visibility of women made me think about the uh, distractingly sexy um, women scientists, you know, when so women were, um, I can't yeah. remember the name, oh, I'm yeah. not going to give his Dread name. The whole but, you hashtag know. dress yeah. like a woman thing. So, yeah. you know, this idea that even when we are being visible we're being visible in the wrong way so um you know legs it on the front page of the sun when you've got the prime minister and the first minister discussing brexit so um a there's the, the sort of issues that come with visibility and, and how that is then once you are seen you you know you're, you're often treated in a, in a misogynistic way 
And that's where I think the, you know, that's where parties um, and bodies, so whether that's the parliament or the, or the city chambers, have have to step up and make those things easier. So is it about changing, do we really need 10 hour long council meetings, you know, which which means people um, can't have the, the childcare they need? Um, is it about calling out misogyny when it happens and having a really strong um, social media policy because it's not just enough to say women stand it's enough to say you have to say women stand and when you do we will be there all the way and I think that's a really important message for, for the campaign you're running is that it doesn't end after the nominations deadline it doesn't end after the hustings it has to be about long-term support and that's something all of the work in gender is part of the um, uh, the equal representation coalition which includes lots of other equalities bodies looking at race sexuality and disability and, and again that's been a message throughout that you can't just look at the top level, you have to look at the activist base. As you say, you have to build up this profile, this visibility, but you also have to look at the structures that surround that and enable that. So what does volunteering mean? Women are far more likely in political parties to be doing the invisible volunteering. So taking, obviously the, taking the meeting, minutes. taking the minutes, yeah. the pastoral care, which is a huge, you know, so helping people when something's gone wrong or listening to people moan, uh, making the tea, um, doing social media, um, all these things that you can work around childcare or um, other constraints, part-time work, these sorts of things, um, which doesn't give you the same profile, even though, so a woman might be spending 20 hours a week doing um, spreadsheets, you know, for a party, inputting, inputting, canvassing data, whereas a man can go out for one and a half hours on a Sunday morning, tweet a picture of them doing canvassing, say, I have great conversations on the door, of course, that's important too. But the profile that that man gets is so disproportionately different than a ma than a woman who maybe says, "Oh well, I, you know, I've done all this work for the party, prove it." You know, mm -hmm. so 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 I, you know, there's also something that the parties need to do to maybe promote the work that is being done by women and and disabled people and all you know the the folk that aren't tweeting themselves climbing up tenement stairs on a Sunday morning. Um, and so supporting them to be visible and not just saying, well, sorry, actually, if you don't like getting up and speaking, then you, you're not set up for a politician. Mm. And I mean, and part of this is a problem with politics. And we all know politics is is terrible <laughs> in many, many ways. But you We're know, trying to get women into it. <laughs> it's, it's awful, don't do it. No, do. Um, but, <laughs> you know, if you look at the, the job of a councillor, for example, what we're told to be, a, what, what you need to do to be elected as a councillor. So first to get selected in your party and then to get elected is to be a very good public speaker, um, be have lots of knowledge about politics and be able to use good rhetoric and make a blasting speech and speak at a rally. Um, you need to yeah go and chat to people a lot. You need to always be able to answer emails and tweets and Facebook messages within 10 minutes or your rating goes down, all these sorts of things. That's half of being a councillor. And yeah, you can stand up in the chamber and, and make your play for more investment in play parks. But there's also huge amounts of being a councillor, which is casework. So which is someone coming to you and saying, I've got a problem, and which is you su supporting them, reassuring them, with them, working with staff, finding out the housing policy for that particular area, getting it sorted, chasing it up next week. Now that is not glamorous, and that is the work that people, that's life admin that people do all the time and women do more of. And they yeah, hugely women suited to, to be very you know, good at, yeah. Um, it, it's essentially parenting for your constituents, <laughs> you know? So, so, but that is never, ever talked about. That When we say, oh, you've got a real qualities of a politician what do you mean you're really yeah. good at arguing and how many times have we heard men say you know in hustings oh well i'd be good at this because i love arguing that's terrible quality mm -hmm. for actual productive politics so there's also something about shifting that you know the visibility is important but what what are we what tasks are we holding up and putting on the pedestal there when we're saying you need to be visible doing them um and i think that's an issue with with politics as a whole with parties um in that I don't think, you know, the, the public school style of politics isn't getting us very far. So actually, what are the skills we need? And what, what do we nurture? What do we hold up and say, you'd be a great person because you're kind? I mean, I, I'm not saying all women are kind. I'm not saying all men are nasty, but... But it's we have such changing an un, all of yeah, politics, not an just... such nuanced view. So, uh, yeah, I, I guess what the way I would interpret what you've just said is that, you know, adding a few more women into politics is not the be all and end all of fixing the system yeah it's one aspect of fixing a system something that i found in my life so in more than 20 years of my career nearly i've always been the only engineer woman engineer in my office and except for once 
I worked for one year for one company which had a significant number of women engineers and there seemed to me to be a sort of tipping point around 40 percent mm -hmm. where it changes from it's weird to have women around to it's perfectly perfectly <laughs> normal and it's something that i think professions like law and medicine mm -hmm. Uh, have seen and teaching teaching was 100 years earlier than those two professions but where where it used to be something by men and is now considered to be mm -hmm. perfectly normal for women to do but politics isn't there yet science isn't there yet, and engineering isn't there yet so i that that's kind of my experience of it mm. that you, he, we need to get to this tipping point and then at that point maybe we don't have to do all this extra stuff because it will be considered normal yeah i think that's true and I, that's one of the things i find quite heartening is how quickly these things can shift you know and the example often used is you know pink being for girls and blue for boys which you know in victorian times was the other way around and things being seen as women's careers and men's coding you know you talk about yeah, tech so you know the images of the you know hidden figures in the nasa um engineer with the code which was seen as drudge admin work and then as soon as it got the profile and the prestige it became actually maybe men want to be coders so you know that's heartening these things can can shift and it doesn't take a huge amount with politics specifically and, and, and gender's big advocates for quotas um the, the the point at which um countries looking at lots of international examples tend to get to organically without quotas is about 40 percent um no it's very difficult for countries to get to 50 percent without some sort of balancing mechanism it evens out about 40 and that's great it's a lot we're, better than councils are doing yeah i think we're, but, um, we're, we're not there but with msps we well so with msps the first year of the scottish parliament we had more women than we do now so we've gone backwards and we've stayed stagnant for the last two hollywood elections that's we've so stayed depressing. stagnant exactly yeah. and that's and it doesn't have the balancing mechanisms so this idea that oh it'll just write itself as soon as it won't we need the mechanisms to get there um and whether that is um, now, I mean, Scotland currently doesn't have the legislative powers to introduce quotas, but hopefully it will be able to at some point. Um, but obviously most parties in Scotland use some sort of quota or balancing mechanism. Um, and for many people, the, you know, the argument is, is fairly clear on that. Um, uh, women 50-50 who I'm, I'm on the board of and have to look at their Twitter account, would, there's still obviously lots of people that think it's a terrible idea. Um, but I would say the case is fairly well made that we need these these structural changes because it doesn't just happen on its own um you do get to this leveling out point um and you know and then there's also that again go to go back to visibility which has been i guess a key theme of this podcast is the idea that um there was a study done uh, in the us looking at sort of crowd scenes in in movies or in rooms in conferences and things and you ask people um, how many women and men they think there were and if there's around 17 percent of women people generally think it was equal numbers oh um, that's crazy and if it's 50 percent, people think well, it was just full of women wow <laughs> so you know we don't we don't even see you know we don't even see the imbalance because we're used to seeing we, we it spot is, one we woman see it on as own, normal yeah exactly so wow. um yeah so that's sort of that's a tangent really but that the idea of visibility like even you know a lot of people would look at a picture of the chain of, of Holyrood which is and, and you know a lot of people think oh 40 percent that's pretty good you know 38 percent mm. and it does sound good until you flip it the other way and you say mm. right so that's over 60 percent mm. of men you know so because we're, we're so used to it being rubbish yeah. <laughs> isn't that interesting so we've been running some q a sessions with potential candidates and the number one worry of women candidates is getting abuse on social media mm. That is what everyone is really afraid of. Yeah, I mean, um, with good reason, they, they will. I mean, and that and that's why I, I always feel a little bit uncomfortable talking about getting women to stand, although absolutely women should stand, because we should not lie about it. We shouldn't sugarcoat it and say you're going to get an easy ride. You will not. You will have to deal with a lot more crap than your male colleagues will, undoubtedly. Um, I mean, on social media, there, there's all sorts of good guidance um, around, you know, block and don't feel the tro feed the trolls and all those sorts of things but that doesn't take away from the fact that you you will you, you're you know you misogynist will be able to get into your phone and you know give you a, a, a misogynistic tweet at any time of the day um and again that's something that a lot of the time you just hear the advice that is oh we'll just ignore and block not good enough that is not good enough that is victim blaming frankly um we need to be taking much more serious action on this and that means that um, male councillors, male politicians need to step up and step in when this stuff happens. And we, we've seen some real, you know, you talked about sisterhood and normalising the idea that women support each other. And there's been some really great stuff with um, 
women MSPs, you know, having each other's backs from different parties, calling it out when they see it. And, and men often don't. And I appreciate you feel uncomfortable in the age of me too. But like, no, I didn't swear. I didn't swear. Um, you know, you, you, you're stepping in and it's about the party stepping in. So if you see something, if, you, if you're not sure if to, whether to engage, send a DM to your colleague and say, oh, or, like, or text them, don't look at your Twitter. Let me log in and delete the stuff. You know, when in the um, the abortion referendum, repeal the eighth in uh, Ireland, one of the great things we talk, uh, I went out there to do some campaigning, and there was was talking about the sort of gender balance within the campaign because there were so many men, and we don't get men campaigning for reproductive rights in the UK in the same way. Um, and I was asking how it worked, and you know how, and they were like, "Well, the women run the campaign; they have the profile. The men do with the social media. So they <laughs> get, they see the photoshopped images, and they delete them. They are the first line of that defence, you know. And so just those things that that, that doesn't work for everything, obviously, but um, stepping it up and parties pursuing, uh, reporting it to the police, checking in, having pastoral care that isn't always done by the women." For the for the, the women, you know, if if a, if a woman is elected, if anyone's elected for a political party, that party has a duty of care, and you know, I, and I don't think that's something any party has really got right yet. So, yes, yes, women are going to face that more if you choose to be on social media, and again, that's that's where the balance between this visibility comes in. You know, do you do you have to do all of that? Maybe you don't. Look, you know, maybe you find other ways to do it. Um, and, and you know, being prepared for that allows you to protect yourself a little bit more, and having separate pages for your political profile and for your personal ones. But essentially, it that is a structural issue, and it is it's not your fault. And I think that's again something really important that we need to know is it's the patriarchy. That's why you're having to work so much harder than your male colleagues. That's why you're having to explain things twice as many times as they do. That's why you're facing the abuse that they do not face. Um, and that's why they probably don't understand how much it impacts on you. So men, get educated, talk to your colleagues, figure out what to do, um, believe them when that happens. All, all the really, really basic stuff. Um, but parties need to really step up and have a good policy, have a publicly available policy that says, if you're getting abuse, this is what you do. You talk to the media liaison, you decide, do you want this to be a press story? Because that is a press story, you know, women counsellor getting stalked, mm. getting raped, that's whatever. Do we want this hushed up? Do we want this to be a story? Don't do anything without their consent. Um, figure out the support that they need. Check in on them. Send them a cup of coffee. You know, whatever it might be. But take it seriously. Mm. Um, it's not frivolous. It is It is people's lives on social media now. Um have someone with them when they go to hustings if that's if that's what it's ne was needed and also the, the institutions themselves so again the you know the, the city chambers parliament and obviously there's been a lot the scottish parliament's doing a lot of work around the sexual harassment um issues at the minute but looking at, at these things in a holistic way and saying these are all the different you know issues and attacks that women face because they are women and they are daring to be in politics um so yeah, women. There are there are, you know there are lots of good things you can do yourself to help with that, but essentially, other people need to be stepping up, and that's that's what that's what encouraging women to stand is. It's so much more than saying, "Do you know what? You'd be a great politician." It's you'd be a great politician, and I've got your back for the next mm -hmm. five years. So I've got. I had a really interesting email this week. We had a one of our trans women members say that she was going to stand, mm -hmm. and I wrote back and said. Wonderful, I'm delighted and terrified for mm -hmm. you because, of course, if you're a disabled woman or woman of color mm -hmm. or a trans woman, the amount of abuse is quadrupled. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it's pretty awful. And she sent me back a lovely email which said, "Here, here's what I need. I need people. I need other trans mm -hmm. women around me, but I need other." people of different genders around me because I need some people around me who aren't specifically target that abuse to kind of help me kind of laugh it off and put mm -hmm. it away. But then I also need people who are targeted that abuse who can share with me the feeling. Yeah. So I thought that was a really practical way of saying, look, this mm -hmm. is going to happen. I'm aware that this abuse is out there and here's what I need mm -hmm. to solve it. So thank you for telling me all that stuff, Alice, because as co-leader of the party, I'm very much hoping to put in place these sorts <laughs> of systems because I do not want... Um, any of our, our women members mm -hmm. or, you know, non-binary members uh, f suffering any more than, you know, the, than we, than we the sort of what we can, what we can cope with. Um, so, Alice, just to kind of wrap up with one last question, what would you say to any woman who says, oh, politics isn't for me? 
Um, I would tell them that they are probably already doing politics um, and politics with a big P is not that different than politics with a little P. Um, and I mean, some women will be right. I mean, they're not everyone suited to being in politics or want to be, and that's totally fine. I would say the same to a lot of men as well. Um, but absolutely, every woman should give it a go. Um, it's, it, is, it is a great experience, but do it with your eyes open. I think that's why I'd say um, there's, you know, there's obviously a balance between scaring people off, which we absolutely don't want to do, but also just saying, it's great. Once you're a politician, everyone loves, you know, it's, it's not that. And we all know that. And I think, so I think the example of the email you just shared is a really good one. It's it's identifying what you need. And not everyone will know that. And that's where the party comes in to, to try and help out. But um, absolutely, women, give it a go. And there's so many different ways to be involved in politics. So um, you can stand, you could be a campaign manager for someone, you can support someone. Um, there's community councils, you can dip your toe in the water. Um, you can run in case there are any more snap uh, elections, you know, where... Uh, you know, you'll know your party, you might not be that likely to get elected in, in certain places, certain elections, you can try these things out, dip your toe in the water, um, and then, and give it a go, absolutely, um, but make sure you're badgering your party to give you the help you need. Wonderful, thank you so much for your time, Alice. Can I give a very quick plug? Yeah, please so, do. Um, for we, we have a tool in gender um, called the Equal Representation in Political Parties tool, um, which is a sort of um, assessment, online assessment of how the party is doing um, in six different areas. So from um, selection to running meetings to engagement. Um, and it's it's anyone can use it. And so a branch level, party level or just individuals, it's equalrepresentation.scot. And it gives you um, a bespoke sort of action plan for how you can improve things for women, people of colour, disabled people, um, LGBTI members. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you, Lorna.